Joining me now is Senior Managing Attorney at the Center for Constitutional Rights, Shana Kadidal, and from Washington, National Executive Director and Co-Founder of the Council on American Islamic Relations, Nihad Awad. Um, Nihad, let me start with you. Just in terms of the, the news that we have this hour, that there was no apparent connection between what happened in Parliament yesterday and the uh, what is being characterized as a terrorist act on Monday. I, I wonder what you make of the assessment by both White House officials and Canadian and government officials that this was a terrorist act. How much of that do you think is connected to the fact that we are talking about someone who converted to Islam? Okay, well first of all thank you for having me and um, our hearts and uh, prayers uh, go out to the families of the victims uh, of this uh, tragic incident that happened uh, yesterday. Um, I will leave it up to the um, uh, intelligence communities to decide whether this is uh, a terrorist act or a, an act uh, by the ranged individual. But the more we see uh, information about the background of the gunman, the more we hear about his and learn about that he is a troubled individual uh, with criminal history, uh, obviously with mental issues. And this is an important factor that we should keep in mind as we look at this incident that happened yesterday. The other factor is um, I'm saddened to see that many uh, media commentators and politicians uh, are using the, the Islamic point here by just saying he converted to Islam, he reverted to Islam, that there's an Islamic component in it. And I believe this shows either ignorance or and lack of information, lack of knowledge about Islam itself. Uh, had, had the religion of this individual been not Islam, it would not have an issue. It would not have been an issue. And unfortunately, people do not know that if you are Muslim, if you are a devoted Muslim, if you go to a mosque, that means you are more likely to uh, be peaceful and to protect innocent lives and, and not to hurt them. So the fact that uh, Islam is being wedged into this incident it shows either ignorance, hostility, and in either case, it doesn't serve the purpose of securing our nation, protecting our uh, uh, fabric. And um, in a way, let me just say at the end that uh, I'm impressed by the police chief and some politicians in Canada in reaching out to the interfaith community, to the Muslim community, to make sure that they are safe. But because if the intention behind this terrorist attack or uh, murder that took place yesterday was to cause us to hate each other, then they fail. And right. I, it, it needs leadership, it needs broad understanding, and not just to have knee-jerk uh, knee, uh, you know, knee reaction. Shana, let me go to you. In terms of the rush to judgment here, um, you know, th there are a, a few folks who of this have said, well, wait a second, there is a difference between someone who is a terrorist and someone who is a deranged, unhappy person with a gun. And yet it has been surprising, I think, to see even Josh Ernest at the White House say this would consider it a terrorist act. And, and I guess from sort of a constitutional civil liberties, you know, a, a, a rights perspective, how distressing is that? Right, right. I mean, it shows how far we are from any coherent, you know, notion of what the word terrorism means. Right. It's really just a watchword for we should intervene overseas and, uh, and you know, a whole bunch of other things connected with that. Well, and the and inextricable link between what some folks see as, you know, uh, one religion, and if that religion is mm -hmm. associated in a violent act, it then becomes an act of terror. Sure. Terrorism, Islam, overseas intervention, right. military response, right? Whereas this seems much more like ordinary crime. Someone with a troubled past, a history of, of run-ins with the law and drug problems and so forth. Right. I think, um, you know, Harper is out there calling it a terrorist act because he wants to link it to Canadian resolve to kind of stay the course with right. their, you know, sort of uh, military actions with us overseas. Right. But, um, uh, you know, again, I think, you know, there's a long history of, uh, of disaffected, marginalized sort of people um, latching on to imagery um, about supposed government oppression uh, and, you know, using that to kind of justify their own sort of lashing out. I mean, Tim McVeigh, you know, right. obviously talked about Ruby Ridge and Waco, right, and ISIS, you know, 
itself has sort of alluded to Guantanamo, put that imagery of orange jumpsuits in their videos and, and so forth. And in fact, some of the ISIS uh, military commanders seem to have been Saddam's own commanders who ended up in U.S. prisons because they were Ba'ath Party members and got radicalized there. And now, you know, ISIS is this sort of Sunni, um, you know, former Ba'ath sort of uh, person's uh, sort of, uh, you know, rebellion, right, against the, the Shiite government. So, you know, I think this is, this is not really anything new. Um, you know, one of the really troubling things about this whole thing for me is that, um, you know, his mosque, apparently, when he started acting right. oddly, they asked pushed him, him away. They asked him to leave. Right. right? I, and, and I think that's a hugely important piece here. And he had, to, to that component, uh, you know, Reza Aslan has a piece in New York Magazine that preceded what happened in Canada, but I think it's important that we remember these words in a time like this. He says, ISIS has managed to draw Muslims from around the world to their cause by setting themselves up as a group that is addressing their grievances, whatever those grievances may be. You are one of us, not because you believe the things that we believe, not because you share the same ideology that we share, but because we share the same grievances. I feel like that's an important point to remember that ISIS is a clearinghouse for people who are frustrated and have a certain set of grievances, but not particularly because of the Muslim faith. Absolutely. In fact, uh, despite the Muslim faith, they're doing right. this. ISIS is, has utilized and exploited legitimate grievances in the region. Uh, had we, for example, as the Western nations, uh, superpowers, including the United States, had we acted in advance in support of the Syrian people in their quest to freedom, we would not have, uh, you know, so-called ISIS. Had we uh, stood by the Iraqi people uh, after the invasion, and had we not supported uh, the uh, sectarian uh, Nuri Maliki regime in Iraq, we would not have ISIS in Iraq. So lack of the uh, intervention and uh, uh, correct foreign policy on time, working responsibly in the region, looking at the issues, uh, has given uh, extremist organizations like ISIS to exploit the absence of leadership to recruit young people. But also, let me, let me say that it is very important for people to know that ISIS is acting in, in spite of Islam. Uh, I am one of uh, 120 people who signed an open letter to ISIS refuting their religious argument and uh, justification for what they're doing. And we have proved in that open letter that ISIS is not only un-Islamic, it is acting against the Islamic faith that prohibits the hurting and killing of innocent people, um, uh, uh, emissaries, journalists, and, and messengers. And, and, and of course, you know, 28 docu 28 page document has dismantled the argument that ISIS has been exploiting and recruiting yeah. young, uh, uninformed, and the people with troubled history. Nihad, 